Well, I would like everyone to join me in welcoming Associate Justice Joshua Groban to the first meeting, the inaugural meeting of the 2020-2021 Board of Trustees. Justice Groban began serving on the California Supreme Court in January of 2019. Prior to that, he was a senior advisor to Governor Jerry Brown and advised the governor on judicial appointments, legal policy, and legislative issues. He received numerous awards from bar groups and other legal organizations for his work on judicial appointments, having advised Governor Brown on the appointment of more than 600 judges. I know additionally that he worked closely with our uh, Jenny Commission, as well as our Council on Access and Fairness um, in some of that work on the appointment of judges. We thank him for that. Um, this is Justice Groban's second time doing the board the honor of performing the swearing in of new members and officers of the board. He joined us this time last year um, for the swearing in of new trustees. With that, I want to thank Justice Groban for joining us once again and turn it over to him for the swearing in. Donna, thanks for the kind words. Uh, prior to swearing you in, I've been asked to uh, give a few remarks and um, though there'll be few, um, I'm delighted to do it. For, first and principally, I, I wanna say congratulations to each of you and your families. I, I recognize that managing the admissions discipline and regula regulatory system for more than 250,000 lawyers can be a huge and sometimes thankless undertaking. And to do it amidst a massive global pandemic, great social unrest, incredible economic uncertainty, and the most contentious election cycle in our lifetimes is perhaps beyond the call of duty but you have nonetheless answered the call and we are grateful. I know firsthand that just one of the issues you're now grappling with, which is the administration of the bar during the COVID pandemic has presented countless challenges. And that's just one facet of your broad charge. One that also includes everything from attorney discipline to access to justice issues, judicial diversity initiatives, fiscal and operational management of the bar, elimination of bias, the state bar fee bill, and lawyer referral services. The undertaking is immense and important, but you are the right people for the job, dedicated, experienced, committed, and wise. As I compose my thoughts for today, I could not escape from the thought that Justice Ginsburg, as we speak, lies in state at the Capitol, the first woman to do so in our country's history. So I wanted to pause and make a few remarks about that. I should first say that some of my thoughts borrow from an article written in the publication, The Forward, uh, authored by Molly Conway. Because Justice Ginsburg, like me, is Jewish, and because she passed on Rosh Hashanah, the, which is the Jewish New Year, many have been using a traditional Jewish saying to memorialize her death. May her memory be a blessing. That's true, but I wanted to add a bit of perspective about what that means. Jewish tradition, by and large, does not focus on the afterlife. We don't have much of a developed sense of heaven and hell. So when Jews speak of right and wrong, it is not really about the idea of getting into heaven. We are supposed to work to be good people because justice is its own reward. We don't know what happens next, but we know what happens here and that is enough. One of the themes of Rosh Hashanah suggests that very righteous people die at the end of the year because they were needed until the very end. Those who die on the New Year holiday are considered a sadiq, a title given to the righteous. And some of you may recognize that word because it comes from the Hebrew word sadaka, which is often translated as charity, but is more accur accurately defined as righteousness. In the Torah, in one of uh, the most uh, famous passages, we are strongly enjoyed, enjoined, justice, justice, thou shalt pursue. Rabbinical commentators have said that the repetition of the word justice is designed to underline the importance of the command. 
Sadaka is not really charity in the sense of being an act of kindness. Instead, it is given as an act of redress as part of the process of seeking a just world. So when we say someone like Justice Ginsburg was a Sadiq, we don't mean she was a good person. We mean she was righteous, that she was a person who committed herself to equal justice under the law. And when we say, may her memory be a blessing, the blessing we speak of is not, may we remember her fondly. The blessing is this, may you be like Justice Ginsburg. Jewish thought teaches us that when a person dies, it is up to those who bear her memory to keep her goodness alive. We do this by remembering her. We do this by speaking her name. We do this by carrying on her legacy. We do this by continuing to pursue justice. As I suggested at the outset, the work you do for the state bar is at the core of these fundamental principles, justice for all under the law. And I suggest that you use the memory of Justice Ginsburg or anyone else who you admired that embodied these fundamental principles to inspire you. May her memory be a blessing for each of you in the work you do here for the bar, in your own workplaces, and in your homes. Congratulations on this important achievement and good luck. I think the next order of business is to um, swear you in, which is always a, a, a happy privilege for me. Um, I'll take, I, I think the plan is to take you in turn, um, starting with Sean. Um, so Sean, if you can raise your right hand um, and repeat after me. I, Sean Seleg. I, Sean Seleg. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. The Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. To the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. And that I will well and faithfully. Discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Discharge the duties upon which I'm about to enter. Congratulations. Thank you. Ms. Ganong, if you could raise your right hand and repeat after me. Oh, I'm sorry. We're gonna start with, uh, we're gonna next do uh, Mr. Duran. Mr. Duran, if you could raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Reuben Duran. I, Reuben Duran. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. The Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance 
to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. To the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. And that I will well and faithfully. Discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Discharge the duties upon which I'm about to enter. Congratulations. Thank you, Your Honor. We'll now swear together Ms. Ganong, Ms. Chen, and Mr. Sowell Jr. If each of you could unmute your microphones and raise your right hand and repeat after me. I state your name. I, Highland Chen. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. The Constitution of the, the United Constitution States. Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies. Against all enemies, domestic. foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. The Constitution of the United the States. The Constitution and the of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this, I take obligation, this freely. obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. And that I will well and faithfully. Discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Discharge the duties upon. Discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Congratulations to each of you. Justice Groban, I want to thank you so much. This has been a year of firsts. This is probably the first time the State Bar has ever administered the oath of office virtually. Um, we hope to see you next year, and we hope to see you in person next year, and we hope you will consider that, um, our invitation seriously. So thank you so much for being here today with us. It was a pleasure. I was delighted to participate. Sarah, always nice to see you again. Nice to see and congratulate each of you, and good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Yeah. All right, we're going to bring all the board members online now and call our board meeting to order. All right, Sarah, uh, we're going to note the meeting is commencing at 1018. And when you are ready, please call the roll. Okay. Broughton. Here. 
Shen. Here. Cis Cisneros. Here. Dela Cruz. Here. Dellen. Here. Duran. Here. Ganong. Here. I believe that Iglesias and LeBron are not here today. Um, Pertula. Here. Sowell. Here. Dollings. Here. Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to the first meeting of our 2020 to 21 Board of Trustees meeting. Um, I'm going to start with the chair report today. Uh, then we will take a break and continue with public comment, <clears throat> public comment and the rest of our agenda. I'm honored to serve as your chair for the upcoming year. I want to congratulate Ruben for being named vice chair to Highland Chen for being named to a second term on the Board of Trustees and welcome our newest board members, Christine Ganong and Arnie Sowell. We look forward to having a good year with you. I'm here in the boardroom today at 180 Howard Street in San Francisco, rather than at home or on video as has become the new normal. I look forward to the time when we can resume our in-person meetings. And I especially look forward to welcoming our new colleagues, Christine and Arnie in person and shaking your hand. As Alan said yesterday, one of the reasons this board works well is the mutual respect we show for each other and our differing views. That has continued to be sure as we have conducted our meetings by video, but nothing is quite like seeing each other face to face. Unfortunately, I anticipate that we are not likely to return to in-person meetings until at the earliest uh, our planning meeting in January. Our next regular meeting in November is also likely to be by video. Stay tuned, no pun intended, for updates. Needless to say, our video meetings are just one example of why 2020 has not been and will not be a typical year. COVID is going to continue to impact all of our lives and state bar operations for the foreseeable future. I want to thank all of our state bar staff who have kept this organization running at all levels during this difficult period, uh, from every function from board support to running the call center. Uh, adapting virtually overnight to wide scale remote operations and telecommuting without missing a beat. Before talking about the issues and challenges we face as a board in the coming year, I want to pause on what it means to me to serve as your chair. We all come to the board through different paths and bring different life expectations, uh, different life experiences and areas of expertise to our service here. For me, part of my path was spending much of my legal career working in the field of legal ethics, including many years on the State Bar Committee on Professional Responsibility and Conduct. Acting as chair of the State Bar Board and participating not only in the formulation of professional standards, but their enforcement is especially meaningful to me for that reason. We talk often here at the State Bar about lawyers' role in providing access to justice. Equally important is the profession's role in furthering the rule of law, something that has never been as important as, as at this time in our history. Part of living under the rule of law is that we lawyers must live up to high standards and the state bar's role in assisting the Supreme Court in enforcing those staff, those standards is something of which we should be proud. But perhaps even more meaningful to me is to take office as only the second openly LGBT leader of this, <coughs> of this organization in its more than 90 years of existence. For all the years I have been involved at State Bar, it was not lost on me that a number of openly LGBT people served on the board, but were never quite able to make the final step to becoming chair, or as this office was formerly known, president of the State Bar. That barrier was broken just a few years ago when Michael Colantono was elected president of the bar. And I'm glad to follow in his footsteps today as chair, not elected by the board, but appointed by the Supreme Court as part of our recent reforms. These milestones are important to the LGBT community, my community, 
but even more importantly to the State Bar's role in advancing diversity and inclusion in the profession. We can't talk the talk if we don't walk the walk. Thinking back to when I was in law school, I certainly never thought I would find my way to a position like this as an openly gay man. Uh, and that was even though I knew back then how much easier I had it than earlier generations of LGBT people. Let me tell you one story about that, a story about change for the better over generations. <clears throat> when I was in college in the late 1980s, I was fortunate to get to know Judge Rand Schrader of Los Angeles, who was one of the first openly gay judges ever appointed in the United States. My mother, who's watching now on Zoom, worked for Judge Schrader, and that is how I got to know him. I have never forgotten hearing Judge Schrader talk to a group of law students in the 1980s. He explained that in the early 1970s, his professors at the UCLA School of Law warned him not to let the state bar find out that he was gay. Otherwise, they said, he might be denied admission to practice on grounds of bad moral character. Think for a moment how absurd this seems today, but it wasn't back then. We cannot take this change for the better for granted and must reflect on how far we've come from time and reflecting on how far we've come from time to time is important to maintaining and continuing progress in equal treatment for all under the law. How I wish Judge Schrader were still with us today to see me sworn in as the chair of the Board of Trustees. Unfortunately, we lost him to the AIDS epidemic some 20 years ago, but I know he is here in spirit and applauding the dramatic changes for LGBT people that have taken place since he began his legal career back in the 1970s. Now, on to the business at hand for our board and to talk a bit about what we have in store for us in this upcoming year. As you know, the State Bar, and as Justice Groban discussed, the State Bar is about to administer the first online version of the California Bar Examination ever given. As is the case with so many things in this age of COVID, the State Bar had to take this, undertake this massive task unexpectedly. Our staff has been working hard to make this formidable effort go as smoothly as possible. They are working to make the best of a difficult situation and we are incredibly grateful for all of their efforts. The exam is now only about 10 days away and we are looking forward to a successful execution of this un unprecedented task. While we hope and strive for perfection, we have to expect some hiccups and deal with them as they arise. In this regard, regarding the bar exam, I want to especially thank trustee Josh Pertula, who has led a working group of board members and staff who have put systematic thought and effort into attempting to make this most unusual administration of the bar exam as uneventful as it possibly can be. In another COVID-driven emergency effort, Trustee Hyland Chen stepped up to the plate to lead the formulation of a provisional licensing rule that the board approved yesterday for submission to the Supreme Court. This is another way we are addressing the disruption that COVID had, has caused to all of our lives and in particular to our usual licensing processes for new lawyers. Now, in addition to these special efforts to handle licensing operations during the pandemic, we have underway a number of policy studies and new ones planned for the coming year. Um, and I wanna just touch on those briefly. One initiative is already underway. The paraprofessional working group is studying whether and how we might increase access to justice for Californians by licensing non-lawyers to practice law in certain areas at a lower cost to consumers. Thanks to trustee Chris Iglesias for spearheading that effort, which he reported on yesterday. On a similar tack of improving access to justice, the Closing the Justice Gap Working Group will be looking in a very broad way at what other measures can be taken to reduce the justice gap including innovative technical solutions to providing legal advice and assistance to consumers. As those, as those of you who are continuing on the board will remember, this board elected to charter this group with a broad mission that requires broad and visionary thinking. Another initiative we began yesterday 
was the formation of an ad hoc commission to study the discipline system. Among other things, that group will investigate reforms to address the racial disparity that the State Bar discovered by initiating a study into our discipline system on the Bar's own initiative. Uh, and that disparity was for black male attorneys and the board is committed to eliminating it. More broadly, this group will review a range of reforms, some already implemented and some still to be identified and considered that will improve the system's effectiveness in both protecting the public and returning lawyers who have committed mass misconduct to a productive path. This new commission reflects the deepened commitment of the Board of Trustees to focusing on the State Bar's core regulatory admission mission of admitting and disciplining uh, and regulating lawyers. The discipline system has not been systematically studied in this comprehensive fashion since the State Bar Court was formed more than 30 years ago. This effort is the natural evolution of a deep dive into the discipline system that the board its regulation and discipline committee and the Office of Chief Trial Counsel have been undertaking in recent years. So we have an ambitious year ahead of us on all of these special product uh, projects, in addition to our usual responsibilities of managing the state bar. To that end, when we return from our break in a few minutes, I will ask you to approve committee and leadership assignments for the coming year. Anticipating that, I want to thank the trustees who will lead our standing committees subject to your approval during the coming year. Brandon Stallings will continue as RAD chair for a second year, bringing continuity to that important role. Hyland Chen will join him as vice chair. Josh Pertula will take the reins of the finance committee, joined by Jose Cisneros as vice chair. I know they will be a great team. And Sonia Dillon will, if you agree, serve as chair of our audit committee. I know we will be good in good hands with her in charge of that important function and thank her for her willingness to serve. In closing, I look forward to continuing to work with you and our staff on reforming the state bar and furthering its service to the people of California. Let's now take a break for about um, 14 minutes and we will return at 10.45 to continue uh, to begin with public comment and complete our open session and closed session agendas.
thank you so much.
All right, Sarah, are you able to hear me? Yes, I am. Okay. Are we ready to resume? We are. Okay. All right, everyone, welcome back. Uh, we're now going to take a uh, call for public comment. Uh, Sarah, does anyone have a hand raised to give public comment? Um, uh, I don't see any hands raised. All right, if anyone would oh, like to. Moment. There is one. Um, okay. Dag, are you online? Yes, I am. Okay. All right. Well, in that case, let me uh, let me set out our, our procedures for public comment. Um, bar staff, uh, if you'd like to give public comment, raise your hand using the Zoom platform. Bar staff will attempt to call members of the public in the order that they appear. We ask that you, lim you limit your comments to three minutes to facilitate hearing as many members of the public as possible. Maybe moot today. I encourage you not to repeat points that were made by previous speakers. You will be notified when you have 30 seconds remaining. Uh, and at three minutes, your microphone will be turned off and the next member of the public will be called. Um, that's it. So Sarah or Dag, please proceed. All right, the, uh, the first speaker uh, who is in the queue appears to be uh, the name of Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca, you're going to have a virtual mic available to you. Once you unmute that, you'll have three minutes and I'll let you know uh, when you have 30 seconds remaining. I see that your mic, there you go. Okay, I'm not sure I actually have a mic. Can you? Uh, you, you do and it's working. Wonderful, thank news. you. Thank you. I know there's been a lot of focus on diploma privilege and the challenges with the upcoming online bar. I graduated in 2018. I am a parent. I am ready to pass the bar exam. This is my third attempt. And I very much hope that you will seriously consider the open book um, recommendation from many of the deans of the law school. Um, and that's all I have to say because the remote proctoring has been so far a disaster. So just very much hope that you'll seriously consider losing the remote proctoring and going open book so that those of us who are ready to pass can pass without the technical challenge. Thank you. Thank you. The next person who will be speaking is Sinas Nikbach. Uh, once your mic is available to you, uh, you'll unmute it and then you have three minutes. Hi, um, I would like to first congratulate the new appointed members of the state bar in the hopes that decisions can be made to alleviate some of the struggles that um, bar applicants are, well, for me personally, that I am having with the bar exam. Just to give you some personal history, I took the February 2020 bar exam and I did receive a passing score based on the new lower cut score. And um, since then, with the pandemic, um, a lot of issues have arisen that has made it very difficult for me, um, as well as I believe a lot of the bar taking applicants to take the bar exam. Um, my schools are closed. I have two children at home that um, are doing online studying. So not only am I a full-time employee, but I've also been promoted to an elementary school teacher, as well as my husband being home every day. It makes it very difficult to study again for the October 2020 bar exam that is online. Um, as far as with the online bar exam, I've been had, I still have not gotten um, any information from ExamSoft or the bar exam about how to download the mock exams um, because um, I applied to take the test in person because I don't have a quiet place to take the exam. Um, that now they're working on getting me um, laptop permission where um, I'll have to stay in quarantine after taking the bar exam because if I've been potentially exposed to COVID, I can't come home because of, you know, um, being scared of passing it along to my elder parents. Um, and these are real struggles that I'm having um, with this current platform. I appreciate the committee offering the online exam 
um, but it's not very possible for me in the position that I'm currently in. And I would bet, and I would hope that um, we can do something to help um, applicants that are situated in the same position that I am. You where have 30 we have, seconds remaining, thank you. That we took the bar exam in the same year that the um, passage rate was lowered. And um, I have to now take the test in October to get that same score with all of these issues um, in hand. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Savannah Wadsworth. Ms. Wadsworth, you have a microphone available to you, and now that it's unmuted, you have three minutes. Uh, good, out, or good morning. Um, thank you for letting me speak. Um, so I also wanted to raise some concerns that have been raised a couple of times to phone calls to the State Bar um, and to ExamSoft. Um, the, the major issue that I had was being able to answer the questions in the mock exam. Um, and we're, we've all been concerned with wasting time with the faulty software, like having to scroll through the question for the performance test, definitely a waste of time considering we only have an hour and a half. Um, and for the multiple choice questions, I had trouble actually clicking on questions. And I'm just, I'm genuinely concerned that if issues like that happen on the day of the exam where we're wasting time with the um, software issues, um, we're going to end up failing because of the software issues and because ExamSoft doesn't have the customer service, um, the enough customer service available in order to answer the questions. And when I did call the state bar, a very nice man did tell me, you know, that ExamSoft would be hiring more people. But the problem with that is if they have not been trained to handle the type of software issues that we're having, they're not really going to be able to help us regardless. Um, and I'm not too confident in ExamSoft's assurances, um, considering they assured that there wouldn't be any kind of, um, of breaches with people's information. And as we know, know a lot of people's private information has been has been leaked out to the public people are getting um, their bank accounts breached uh, PayPal accounts breached private accounts you know it's it's definitely a security concern considering all we want to do is become attorneys this shouldn't be a condition of being in a, of wanting to be in a position to help the public um, and honestly I'm not too sure that them hiring new people um, if they actually do end up hiring enough people um, is going to help us on the day of the exam. So that's, I, uh, you know, Ms. open Walters, books. You have 30 seconds, thank you. Okay. So I've taken open book exams before and you still have to know the material. Um, regardless, it's still going to be a test of, you know, our ability to take the bar exam. Um, that option just seems like the best considering the circumstances. Um, if anything changes at the last minute, please don't postpone it to February. Um, and please don't put us in a situation where people will end up committing suicide because of the amount of stress that you guys are putting us under just because of this exam software. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ms. Wadsworth. The next speaker will be Pamela. Pamela, your microphone is not yet available to you. I see it now and it needs to be unmuted. Once it's unmuted, you have three minutes. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I, I, want, I, I wanted to echo um, what the two previous speakers said. Um, I, I want them to know and we, I want you guys to know that they're not alone and these issues are being faced by every single applicant who is taking this exam in October. Um, first of all, the state bar, unfortunately, is not on the same page as ExamSoft. For example, the state bar sent us an email yesterday saying that the update to ExamSoft is available today, the 25th, and you can download it. And then ExamSoft today is 
no, State Bar should not have sent that sent out that email. The 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 update is going to be available on the 28th. And this is not the only instance where the State Bar um, and ExamSoft have not been on the same page. And as far as State Bar just referring literally everything to ExamSoft such as saying that, oh, they'll take care of it. Like on, on the day of the exam, they'll have more um, customer service, you know, representatives. How, how many are they going to have? have? There are thousands of, of test takers on October 5th and October 6th. I called the exam soft because I needed to redownload the exam soft. I called them at 4.45 in the morning last week. And at 4.45 in the morning, it took me an hour to speak to an agent. And just, just imagine what it's gonna be like on the test day. But the most important reason I've called today is to push for retroactivity. According to the data that I looked at, the, the people who are eligible for retroactivity that um, have taken the test and are um, eligible under the new cut score, they're in the hundreds. They're, they're not a lot of people. Fairness and equ equity demand that you ask the Supreme Court, you have the position that retroactivity do apply to these applicants. At least some of us can go into the workforce and help the community. And just like the first speaker said, everyone is going through hell right now. I, I, I lost my full-time job and I've been, it's been cut to less than one fourth. You have 30 seconds left, thank you. I, I just want you guys to please take an action. We've been calling for months now. This is not my first time calling. I feel like State Bar is not taking any action. They only refer things, oh, the Supreme Court decided this. That's it, we're not gonna do anything. Please push for retroactivity. Please rethink this online bar and, and try to come up with a solid plan. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be uh, a name that I recognize from yesterday, Claire Salat. Your microphone is available. Good morning. Claire Solot, Legal Services Funders Network and the Bigglesworth Family Foundation. First, I'd like to thank the board for approving the provisional license uh, recommendation yesterday so that it can move forward to the Supreme Court for consideration. And related to that, I'm hoping that the board can put out some sort of public notice um, updating people on the status and an expectation in terms of when applications might be available. As many of you know, Legal Service Funders Network runs the largest post-grad law fellowship for recent grads in the Bay Area. We have over 30 grads that have been placed at over 20 legal service organizations. Many of them have asked if they can participate in the provisional license program and are eager to be able to make a decision in terms of whether they'll be taking the October bar exam. As you know, the experience of new grads as compared to those asking for retroactivity is quite different. And we're simply hoping to be able to give these new grads clarity as to whether it's imperative that they take the bar exam, take time off from their fellowships, or whether it's a better path for them right now based on their circumstances to continue in their fellowships, increasing access to justice and capacity at legal service organizations. I'm also working on public-private funding partnerships right now to continue these programs. So clarity about the availability is imperative so that we can make sure that there are funds available for legal service organizations and public interest organizations to be able to hire these fellows as legal service uh, provisional licensed lawyers. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Our final request to make public comment is coming from RMC, um, are the initials that I see there. And uh, once you have a microphone avail available to you, RMC, uh, doing that right now, uh, your microphone's available and it's now unmuted. You have three minutes. Hi, good morning. So you can hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you for taking public comment. Again, I'm gonna repeat you know, what many other people have said in terms of the issues with ExamSoft. Um, I'm an examinee ready to take the October bar. Um, I don't think that 
there's a lot of confidence in ExamSoft currently. I've been one of the many people who've experienced lag times in typing, um, <clears throat> multiple attempts to download uh, that haven't worked. And each time I've tried to contact ExamSoft, I've waited at least 30 minutes, sometimes an hour, I've been hung up on. Um, I think the larger issue is that this exam will not be a success if anybody is failed because of technical issues. And ExamSoft itself has said that there are likely to be 2.5% uh, of examinees that have some sort of technical issue. And I think that in and of itself should give us all pause particularly because we bear the risks, you don't. Um, in addition, I think that, you know, this is sort of more a, a logistical issue, but the PT, the, <laughs> the PT is just ridiculous. We have a two inch window uh, to write our PT in, which you cannot even see the entirety of your answer. Um, as the earlier person commented about having to go back and forth. Um, you know, and y'all may say things get thrown at you as attorneys and you've got to be able to deal with it. And while that is true, this is not reflective of what practice will be like. And it is a large obstacle uh, that we have to work against without any sort of additional time on the PT. Um, I mean, I think that that's minor compared to the larger issues that I'm trying to address in terms of exam soft. Um, and so I would say, you know, echoing what a lot of other people have said in addition is that the only fair and equitable way to move forward with this and to ensure that we all have an equal playing field and access to success is open book. And again, it is not an easy feat to take the bar exam, even with a book next to you. If you have to look things up too much, you're not prepared. So I really, You have really, 30 seconds left, thank you. Thank you. I really urge you to consider this because doing that now, taking that proactive step could also save you all a lot of headache and a lot of work if things don't go well with the exam and you have even 20 examinees who are failed because they simply couldn't get into the software. And I think that that's something you should seriously consider. So I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. That will conclude uh, our public comment session. All right, thank you, Dag, and thank you to our public commenters. Uh, the next item on our agenda is uh, the executive director's report, Donna. I do not have a report today as I um, did my, my report yesterday. All right, thank you. Uh, the next item is our consent agenda. Uh, does any member wish to, we have just one item on the consent agenda, but does anyone wish to pull it off for discussion? And if not, I'll ask Sarah to take the roll. Excuse me, uh, Sean, but you have a couple of items under the chair's report. <clears throat> the first is the approval of the board committee. Oh, and the second thank, is you. thank you. Thank uh, you. You know, it didn't print out on my copy of the agenda. I can share so it. Uh, no, I remember. It's fine. Let's take up uh, first the uh, item 30-1, approval of board committee liaison and special assignments. Uh, because we have the happy occasion of a new board member joining us this week, I am going to propose some slight modifications to the slate of appointments uh, in front of you in the written agenda item. So uh, I am going to ask you to approve that Arnie Sowell be appointed to the Regulation Discipline Committee, uh, to the Finance Committee, and as one of our Legislative Relations and Communications liaisons uh, in place of Ruben. Uh, Ruben as Vice Chair will be involved in those functions along with me on a regular basis um, and we are very glad to be able to take advantage of Arnie's expertise and experience in that liaison role. So Sarah is now indicating that change for you on the screen.
and she's already made the changes on uh, to the regulation and discipline committee and the finance committee. So with that change, I would invite a motion to approve these assignments. Mr. Jose, I'll move the motion. Sonia here to seconding. Thank you. Unless there's any discussion, let's proceed to a roll call vote. Broughton. Yes. Chen. Yes. Cisneros. Aye. Dela Cruz. Yes. Dellen. Yes. Duran. Yes. Donna. Yes. Pertula. Yes. Sowell. Yes. Darling. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, we'll next take up item 30-2, uh, which is informational only. It's our multi-year schedule of Board of Trustees meetings. Make sure and put those in your calendars. Um, and let's return then to the consent agenda. Uh, there's one item, annual approval of secretary. Uh, unless anyone would like to take it off consent for discussion, I'll ask Sarah to take the roll call to approve the consent agenda. Yeah, we do need a motion in a second. Um, I'll move right. it. I'll move. I'll Juan? second. Whoever. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. So I have Dela Cruz moving and Duran seconding. Seconding. Um, <laughs> Broughton? Yes. Chen? Yes. Cisneros? Aye. Dela Cruz? Yes. Dellen? Yes. Duran? Yes. Ganong? Yes. Bertula? Yes. Sowell? Yes. Stallings? Yes. The consent calendar is moved. Thank you. Uh, we'll next take up item 701, the strategic plan report from our interim executive director, Donna Hershkowitz. I'm just gonna be sharing my screen here. Can you confirm that you can see the front page of the PowerPoint? We can. Okay, wonderful. Um, in January of this year, um, among other things that I said I wanted to accomplish uh, over the course of the, the year, um, was a retooling of the strategic plan. Not substantively, but organizationally. As we discussed at the time, in my view, the State Bar's five-year strategic plan is part strategic plan, part operational plan, and maybe even part tactical plan. Um, unfortunately, the changing face of the world since January um, uh, forced me to deprioritize this effort. And as the plan runs only through January 2022, it doesn't make sense to undertake the effort at this stage. Regardless, as we come into, uh, as we come into the final uh, 12, 15 or so months of the, uh, of the plan, I wanted to take the opportunity to update you on our overall progress. Um, let's get this moving here. Um, I have uh, cataloged each of the um, objectives as complete or still in progress. Um, sometimes I have to admit um, it's a judgment call. Uh, there, are, there are some items that, um, uh, and I'll talk about a few of them as we go through this, some, some items that really are more ongoing in nature. Um, and so they may never be complete. Uh, and so I had to make a judgment call on which category to put them in. Um, and some of the items I just want to remind you were just added in January or March of 2020. Um, and so them still being in progress does not reflect a failure to quickly act on the board's initiatives. Um, so first, um, a high level tally here. Um, we have completed um, all three of the objectives of goal one. Um, um, uh, uh, and I'll be going through these in just, uh, in, on the next following slides. Um, completed eight of the 16 of the objectives of goal two, eight of the 12 objectives of goal three, and nine of the 17 objectives set forth in goal four and all of the objectives in goal five. Um, goal one, um, uh, let's starting with what we've completed. Not to worry, I don't plan to read through each goal and objective. Um, but just give you the highlights here. 
Goal one was focused on our transition to a primarily regulatory agency following the offloading of our trade associ associational functions. This encompassed working with CLA and then the incredible amount of work done to implement the now infamous Appendix I. All of the, goal, the objectives of goal one were completed. Um, goal two uh, is broken down into three component parts. These were objectives related to uh, uh, a fair, timely, and appropriately resourced attorney discipline system, an admission system, and appropriately uh, enforcing our obligations uh, related to the unauthorized practice of law. Um, so if you look at the second objective um, that I've highlighted as completed in, um, on this screen, um, supporting adequate funding for the client security fund. This is an example of the kind of objection which could be characterized as completed or in progress, frankly. Um, maybe it is best characterized as ongoing. As you know, for 2020, we secured a significant increase in funding from the licensing fees for the client security fund, increasing the available funding for distribution by over $5 million. In 2018, we allocated some funding from LAP reserves and redefined the CSF uh, client security fund reserve policy to increase the funding for that year by an additional $3 million. I'm just gonna sort of scroll through um, those objectives from uh, goal two, which have been completed. Um, for you to peruse. Um, and then we'll move on to goal three. If you have any questions on any of these items here in goal two, of course, please feel free to stop me. Goal, th goal three um, is uh, also broken down into multiple parts. The component parts of goal three included objectives related to employee engagement, financial management, information technology, and management of other assets. Uh, I, again, I'm not gonna go through the items here that were the objectives that were completed. Uh, I'll scroll through a couple of screens here. If you have any questions, um, please stop me. The uh, item here on pursuing a two-year fee bill is also one of those items that, that may be ongoing um, in nature. It's certainly something that, uh, that the State Bar uh, has worked toward over, over the entirety of the strategic, the, the, uh, uh, the length of the strategic plan. Um, it is not yet something that has been achieved, though there were recommendations on a multi-year fee bill that were provided by the um, state auditor in uh, its report issued in April of 2019. Moving on to goal four. Um, goal four relates to access to justice and diversity and inclusion in the legal profession. The vast majority of objectives for goal four were added in 2019. Prior to that, as I recall, there were only two objectives that were listed and now there are 17. Goal four is broken into two component parts, objectives related to access to justice and, and objectives related to diversity and inclusion in the legal profession. Highlighting just a couple of the completed, um, actually just one of the uh, completed objectives here. Um, let me point you to one on the top of this slide um, by December 31, 2020, adopt revised rules to modify the elimination of bias MCLE requirements with your approval of the uh, proposed rules at yesterday's board meeting. Um, we have now officially completed that requirement. Um, I, I do also want to mention um, the, uh, the, next, um, the next objective here to develop and publish an annual report card on the state of the profession. We did not make the January 31 date, um, that, but that report card was published um, uh, just a few months ago. Uh, following the report card, we had a, um, the publishing of the report card, we had a diversity summit with the private sector. 
uh, we had um, about 50 or 60 um, participants on that summit following up on the information that was reported in that report card. And we will have a summit in December with the public sector, with the nonprofit sector, also looking at the statistics from that report card as it relates to the public sector, the nonprofit sector, and brainstorming um, how we can improve diversity and inclusion in the legal profession in that sector in particular. And then moving on, the screen is a little slow today. Um, uh, goal five, um, uh, dealing with um, uh, informing and educating stakeholders about the state bars initiatives, uh, responsibilities and resources. Um, and I've indicated that all of these objectives um, have been completed. So my plan is to move forward then to those items that are still in progress. Uh, so, so this is one of the objectives, uh, objective A from goal two. Uh, much of this goal was actually just adopted at the January 2020 planning session. And we, we talked about some of the, these items yesterday as we were uh, looking, uh, hearing the report from the Office of Research and Institutional Accountability on some of the research that has been done on the attorney discipline system. Um, other pieces of this still need to be completed, including the updated workload study for OCTC. And that workload study will be broader than just OCTC. We'll be looking at including the state bar court in that as well as we had in the prior um, workload study. Again, I'm not gonna go through all of these um, objectives which are still in progress, but just touch on some of them. The top one on this slide, um, to begin auditing attorney compliance with MCLE requirements in the most cost-effective an efficient manner no later than December 31, 2020. I am happy to say that this is uh, on track. Um, you adopted a new rule um, some time ago that would, um, that would require MCLE providers to upload to the state bar attorney attendance uh, information at MCLE events. Uh, and we have, we have in fact done a soft launch of a new of that new automated system that would have the MCLE providers upload that attendance information. Um, by having that information, we will be able to do 100% auditing um, as opposed to the one, one to 10% random auditing that we've done in past years. We are on track to launch this program to all MCLE providers by the end of the year. Um, the last uh, item uh, objective on this page, no later than January 1, 2019, require all attorneys to report firm size and practice type to, to the state bar and maintain and update that information. Um, for those continuing members of the bar of the board, that should sound familiar to you. You spent a, a few meetings, as a matter of fact, um, discussing the rules around uh, the uh, rules surrounding this objective um, to uh, report firm size and practice type. And in fact, we had expanded the assignment to look more comprehensively at the data we collect, the data we post on a, the attorney profile, and that we require attorneys to update and maintain on an ongoing basis. Um, you did adopt the rules that would, that would put all of this in place. Uh, what is still lagging behind that, however, is the automation. And uh, that it has been um, slated on the, uh, the IT pipeline. Um, uh, we're looking at, um, 2021 um, uh, to to uh, had to uh, automate uh, those pieces and then that item will be complete. Um, one item that I did want to point your attention to on this slide um, after the results of the February 2019 bar exam are published. Uh, we, are to, we were to evaluate the results of the two-day exam on the pass rates, on the pass rates and costs. Um, this, um, this objective was divided into two pieces. The Office of Admissions studied the, um, evaluated the results of the pass rate of the two-day exam on pass rates. A, a um, report was presented to the Committee of Bar Examiners 
in, I believe, I believe it was last December. Um, um, and, but we faced delays on the piece of it of, of, of uh, presenting a report on the evaluation of the costs. I believe we anticipate bringing that report to the Committee of Bar Examiners in December and then closing the loop with the board on this objective. Um, and then the final um, in progress objective under goal two, conducting California specific job analysis, as you all know and heard repeatedly from staff, um, that job analysis is complete. Um, the report of that job analysis, um, as well as other items, um, was part of the, um, the reason that the board uh, and the Supreme Court launched a, a joint Blue Ribbon Commission on the future of the bar exam. The one reason I left this item as, um, as um, the, the one thing that's, that is uh, not complete on this item uh, is conducting the new content validation study. Um, because that would have been the next step following a, a, a California specific job analysis to look at the bar exam and determine if the bar exam um, needs to be changed based on that analysis. We've sort of jumped that, that, uh, that part of the study moving directly to the Blue Ribbon Commission, which really will be looking at new content for, for the bar exam. So I guess I could equally have put this as a completed item. Moving on to goal three, um, looking again at items that are objectives that are still in progress. Um, and again here, the first objective that I've listed on this slide is one um, that we have done quite a lot with, but I would never mark it as done. Um, this, is, this is an ongoing, um, an ongoing important piece of employee engagement. Um, to ensure uh, performance accountability, to always look toward professional development of our staff, to provide new and greater opportunities for professional development, um, to continue to do to performance manage, and ensure that we are providing appropriate feedback to staff. So I, this is something I would I would never mark um, as done. We are, uh, as with regard to the particular objective, which you see on the screen now, um, one of the uh, pieces um, um, that I just wanted to mention on this was the um, upgrading the, the infrastructure as it relates to desktops. Um, that is, uh, we're no longer doing desktops. We're launching laptops for uh, all state bar employees um, as a result of the um, uh, likelihood of continued working from home for at least some members of state bar staff for a considerable uh, amount of time in the future. Um, and we are, we will be rolling that out starting in the next uh, week or so, I believe, we'll be rolling out the launch of the um, updated uh, equipment um, for those who have um, equipment that is older than, than um, a specified number of years. Goal four, supporting access for access to legal services and the uh, um, increasing the diversity and inclusion in the legal profession. Um, just uh, again, a couple of items here that, um, that are left uh, still in progress. The second um, objective that's noted here on the slide, um, this uh, really was uh, as constructed, it was describing the work of ADELS, which as you know, is complete but it also seems to cover the work of the Closing the Justice Gap Working Group that you heard about yesterday, um, which has not yet begun. And that's why I left this as an uncompleted objective. Obviously the work of that Closing the Justice Gap Working Group um, will not be, is not intended to be complete before uh, January, 2022. And so that piece will need to be continuing into the following strategic plan. And then uh, just to the last two um, objectives that are listed on this slide, supporting public, public education about key problems not recognized as legal issues. And this is one of the things that we've talked about that uh, contributes to the justice gap, um, that individuals have problems that they don't even recognize to be legal problems. And so they're not seeking legal help for those, for those problems. 
Um, and then the following bullet, the following objective, supporting efforts to attract and retain lawyers in legal aid organizations. Both of these last two objectives emanated from our work with the, with the Justice Gap um, study uh, and were added to the strategic plan um, in, at the January planning session. Um, and so again, the, um, the fact that these are not completed represents only that they are newly added objectives um, and not any um, uh, dilatory uh, behavior on the part of the state bar. And with that, um, that, is the up, that is your update on the strategic plan. Happy to answer any questions. Mr. Chair, if I may. Yes, Ruben. Uh, thank you. Donna, thank you for uh, the comprehensive report. I have, I guess, just a couple of uh, comments on the goals achieved and then a question on one of the in progress. Uh, two of the things that struck out that stuck out to me um, that I wanted to say particular thank yous for um, and congratulations uh, on the completed goals. The first is the successful um, implementation of communication strategies related to UPL, unauthorized practice of law. I, I know that is a, a big um, undertaking and, and I feel like uh, staff was innovative and persistent in their efforts to reach out to those affected communities and to try and address the problem. I know it's a uh, it's it's not going to go away ever as a problem, but certainly I feel like we made some meaningful efforts um, to uh, chip away at that problem. The second uh, was on the toolkit issues with the Judicial Council. Uh, there again, extremely important issues, and uh, I appreciate um, the work that has been done, and I think it'll um, produce some good results moving forward. On the question, um, the question that I have relates to your comment on the MCLE auditing. Yes. And I think I heard you say that we, uh, we've we shifted now from the 10% random auditing to the ability to do 100% auditing on MCLE compliance. Is that correct? That is the, that is the shift that will be happening. Um, okay. so, so up until today, or still currently, um, uh, the uh, attorneys at the end of their three-year um, MCLE compliance period um, report whether or not they are in compliance, and they, i.e., whether they've met the 25 hours, the and the um, specific hour requirements for legal ethics, competence, and elimination of bias. They, they it's a check mark that attorneys enter um, into their my state bar profile. Um, what we have switched to is a system where the MCLE providers who were required currently to maintain a list of those who attend their events, we've, in, we've instead said to, that, that the MCLE providers will be uploading that information to the state bar system. It will be shown on each attorney's attorney profile. Um, so they will have a list in front of them of all of the courses that, that they take after the, once the system is launched. Um, and that will give them a good tool to know if they are um, if they are on track to complete their MCLE requirements. And it will give us the ability, because we will know um, what courses they have taken, to be able to audit all of the of the attorneys in the in the compliance group. Right now, we do a random sample of between one and ten percent of the attorneys who were in the compliance group, we reach out to them, we ask them to provide their certificates of attendance um, in the MCLE courses. We add, add up the credits and make sure that they have completed their, all of the requirements and the requirements in the special areas. Because it will be online, we will not need to do it that way. There will be a ramp up period um, because um, for example, you know, people who report next year there may just be a few of their hours that are included um, at the end of at the end of by the end of January 31, 2021, and so we'll still need to audit. Um, if we're doing an audit, we're not going to have 100% um, really through the end of a, a three-year cycle. Um, will all of the courses be loaded onto the system? One follow-up question, Mr. Chair. Uh, the yes, please. The individual data per attorney that will be available on the website. Is that um, 
Is that information available to the public as well or just to the attorney in their state bar, my state bar profile? Is this on the um, firm size and, and other data elements? No, no, on the MCLE compliance. It is just, I, I'm sorry, it is just available to the, um, uh, the attorney. It, it won't be displayed to, to the public. Okay, thank you. Chair, can I make a comment? Right. Yes, please. Yeah, this is Juan. So Donna, first and foremost, I don't think we say this enough. Um, thank you for you and the entire State Bar uh, staff for all the hard work. Uh, I can't imagine, well, I can't imagine shifting to virtually um, and doing everything uh, to continue to align with our strategic plan. I think you're doing a, a great job. So I just wanted to acknowledge, take the time to thank you and thank, and thank everyone from the State Bar and continue to support you know, the mission and vision of the State Bar Board and what you're all doing. So I just wanted to take that time and say thank you. On behalf of all the State Bar staff, thank you for this conference. Thank you, Juan. Any other discussion, comments, questions? So Sean, this is Hylin. Um, if I could, um, I yes. echo the, those thanks, Donna. This is an incredible amount of work. Um, I wanted to go back to your comment, a comment that you made at the outset, which is that this strategic document, strategic plan um, is sort of a mix of strategic items as well as operational items, um, which, I, you know, given the state bars shift to being a purely regulatory entity, I think some of the operational items were necessary as part of that shift. You know, based on your experience in, in leading this, do you think it would be useful for the state bar to engage, you know, I'm looking forward to the January um, strategic planning session that we're gonna have as a board to revisit, um, you know, dividing out operations from strategy and to take a hard look at how can we make this more strategic and break out the operational items. Um, so so I, th I, I think that, that there will be an opportunity to talk about and maybe that's sort of a, sort of a cleaner way to think of it than I was actually thinking about it. Um, um, but that, I think that one of the things that we'll want to do in the January planning session is really look at what is what is feasible to get done um, for the last 12 months of the strategic plan. Um, mm -hmm. And when you look at all of the items that are arguably not yet completed in progress or ongoing, it um, it's it feels like a lot, um, but you're absolutely right. Some of these items are just ongoing operational um, issues, which do, which, as I said, I, I don't believe uh, uh, belong necessarily in a strategic plan. And so, uh, one way to address that would be to take those off of the plan, make crystal clear that the board and the board leadership is not minimizing the importance of those, but understanding that they are not strategic plan items, take those out um, and have a focus on the more strategic items. Um, because it will be the last 12 months of the plan, doing an overarching sort of revisiting to what the plan looks like is probably not beneficial. Um, but I definitely suggest for the 2022 planning session, when we are creating the next five-year strategic plan, we really think long and hard about, um, about the strategic objectives and placing those in the plan and then having staff develop operational plans, annual operational plans on how they will be implementing the strategic objectives that are set forth in the plan. That will also result in us not updating the strategic plan um, as often as we seem to. Um, in my reading, it seems that strategic plans are, are rarely amended um, during their, their, their existence, their three-year or five-year plans that really just set a high-level framework, important, ambitious goals for the agency. Um, but then it would be the operational plans which really dictate how we, what, what operational objectives we will uh, engage in to, um, to achieve those high-level strategic goals. So that would be for a 2022 planning session. Um, I strongly encourage us to do that. Great, thank you. 
Any more discussion? Hearing none, I join in the thanks to Donna and our staff. Uh, and we'll, uh, and Donna, I don't think there's any requested action on this item. There is not. Information and discussion? Okay, great. Then we'll move on to item 702. One year, uh, office. One year, I'll figure out, one year I'll figure out how to make this strategic plan update more exciting, but I haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> Maybe some animations. Remember you had that jumping little doughboy type thing <laughs> once? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Office of Finance, mid-year budget variance report uh, and projection. Uh, our chief financial officer, John Adams, will present that. All right. Good, good morning, board chair. Um, I have hopefully an exciting presentation. Um, no animation, though. Um, this item 702 is the mid-year projection, um, which I have just about a dozen slides. Um, now this presentation um, and the, the report is required by the board book, um, set out in 5.21 of the board book that requires an annual review at mid-year and variance analysis. Um, certainly prepared by the office, but when variances come up, we do work with offices to try to identify those and understand those variances for the board. Um, the, the report does have an, a couple of attachments. Um, one or two is the variance is over 100,000 for both revenues and expenses. Um, now these numbers, and for those um, new members of the board, the state bar is on a, fisc a fiscal year that's January through December. So these numbers are as of June 30th, which is our mid-year, the first six months of the year. And then I did present this to the Finance Committee um, at their meeting on September 8th. Um, I talked about this. There is a, attachment A is a fund summary that shows you very high level for all of the state bar funds with not just what the budgeted revenues and expenditures are, what, but with what the projections are, and then what the projected ending reserves are for each of the various funds. So just a few highlights, um, you know, in some cases, um, funds are in good shape based on their specific purposes. Um, there are a few highlights and I'll cover that um, as we go through. Um, legal services fund, um, which is hopefully, hopefully my uh, PowerPoint's still on. Um, IOLTA is um, interest on legal um, lawyers trust accounts. Um, that because of interest rates um, has declined or is projected to be 16 million less this year, um, which will have future impacts on um, providing grants um, to legal, um, legal aid providers. Um, one of the good things with the state budget is the approval of 31 million in um, a grant for homeless prevention that we anticipate this year um, that will hopefully be um, spent within the next 12 months. And then just quickly on the admissions fund, um, very difficult at this point to project how the admissions fund will ultimately um, end for the year. Um, with the online, there was prior to the online and, and decisions by the Supreme Court, there was a huge amount of applicants. Um, I think normally those that take the test is between eight and 9,000. Um, my understanding from the admissions office is before the deadline, um, there was over 12,000 applicants. Um, of course, some of those will decide to request refunds and those were um, available through September 8th. Um, the admissions office is working very hard to process those, um, those refunds and, and with that information at the third quarter, which is at the end of this month, we should have a little better sense of where admissions fund um, is going to end. For those, um, when the board adopted the budget, the admissions fund was using reserves, one for some one-time costs related to AIMS, and then some um, just for other operational needs. Right now, we're projecting that they may be a little closer to break even, but again, too early to tell. So this is um, maybe a little difficult to um, read online. Um, this was in the report. This is attachment eight. This does show you the summary. We usually focus a lot on the general fund. That is where 75, 80% of the staff is um, funded. That is the main fund for discipline um, and regulating uh, attorneys. Um, with that admissions fund, um, and just I'll cover the general fund a little more in detail. Um, the board did adopt a budget that had a deficit of 1.3 million for the general fund. Um, 
that was for one-time costs related to CMS in phase two of improving the case management system for both OCTC and the courts. Um, in looking through, um, there are some funds that are doing some spend down. Bank settlement fund is a good example. Um, for client security, we got the additional $40 this year. So they have um, increased payments in compared to prior years, um, but they're usually, um, is the, the balances that will be left in that fund will be based on how much comes in and then the payments that are made out. Um, you see the equal access fund, the 29.9 million is the projected variance. Um, that is roughly related to the, the, the anticipation of the homeless grant. Um, I mentioned the legal services, that's the 13.5. So those are really the highlights um, for the, at a very high level for um, all the funds. Um, general fund highlights, um, this is something we spent a lot more time on, really focusing on the general fund. The budget adopted growth in active, um, in active, fee, uh, active licenses at about 0.5%. Um, so about 190,000 um, is roughly an increase of 1,000. What actually has occurred um, through, I believe it was through the May um, numbers was only a 0.1% increase in active licenses. Um, so that had a, um, an impact um, between five and $600,000. The other thing that's really um, interesting, and I think we, we didn't know what the impact would be and we didn't, we didn't uh, necessarily adjust accordingly, but scaling with the approval of the fee bill, the fee bill had scaling prior at 40,000, hadn't been changed for 20 years. Part of the fee bill for 2020 increased that amount, the scaling of 25% of a reduction in the licensing fee for those that are making under $64,000. So last year, the fee scaling, um, we had a total of 9,800. Um, and this year, um, 12,300. So, um, you know, an increase there, and you can see the impact was about 300,000 for, for that. Um, other things I'll talk a little more about, interest income with the declining rates, we anticipate a $400,000 decrease right now. Um, Mr. Mazur yesterday talked about rental income. We've been very fortunate um, that the impacts on that um, revenue source has um, been uh, minor um, in compared to maybe other um, landlords, uh, which is again, about 200,000, less than 5%. Um, personnel cost savings, 2.6% or $2.6 million seems to be a lot of money. Um, but again, our, our annual budget on salaries and benefits is close to $100 million. It's about a 3% um, savings. We do anticipate some vacancies throughout the year. I think the vacancies were a little higher, um, at least in the first six months. Um, staffing has uh, over, certainly over the last three months, has built up. Um, OCTC is getting closer to being fully staffed and they're, they've been very working very hard to that. Um, but at least in the first six months, we can count on this $2.6 million in savings. And then travel, um, as we all know, no traveling has really has been occurring for the state bar um, since March. And so at least one of the benefits for the state bar is um, savings of about point, you know, 700,000. And this is not just staff um, that travel back and forth between LA and San Francisco, but um, all the volunteers and all the people who, who support the state bar. So just quickly, um, at the general fund level, um, total budget was $94 million. Uh, um, our projection based on those reductions is uh, $91.3 million, a variance of almost $2.8 million. Um, with that, um, there is the other side of the equation. Um, oh, let me before I go into expenditures, let me talk about um, attorney licensees, uh, license counts. So this graph, um, I just wanted to show you that, show you the numbers between 2019 and 2020. You can see 180,000 with a, with a very slight increase up to 189,800. Um, I think I highlighted this as inactives um, and especially those over 70 um, as baby boomers are um, leaving the profession and um, being inactive um, and they don't pay fees. Once you hit 70 years old, you don't pay the fee. So last year it was 23,000. Um, this year um, at this point it was 26 or right now it's 26,000. So those are individuals that are um, inactive but not paying fees over because they're over 70. 
And then one of the questions that came up um, and with sort of the recession related to COVID and the impacts on licensees, um, I was asked to sort of look at um, how licenses change during the recession from 2008 to 2011. Um, you can see on this that license counts actually increased, revenues continue to increase, um, overall growth of about 2%, 2.2% um, each year. So it, it, not something that actually had an, uh, an impact during the recession as far as licensees. I think the, the impact on licensee going forward are simply the baby boomers um, leaving the, the profession. Um, general fund expenses, I was going to talk about the other side of the equation. Expenses, um, I did mention personnel cost was really the single highest um, area of um, savings. Um, overall, we anticipate about a $3.8 million um, savings for this year within the general fund. Um, the savings in the general fund will offset the revenue reductions, um, which is a good thing for this year and actually reduce what the impacts are on reserves um, that we actually anticipate at the beginning of the year. And then this is just to show you what the adopted budget had related to projections and then um, with the year completing, having a better sense of where reserves are, um, shows you that um, we thought um, that we started the year with a higher reserve balance, which um, once the audit was completed in May, um, that number of 12.6 was the final number for last year. Um, we anticipated as part of the budget process, 15.3%, um, which gives us about 16% as of a reserve. Um, our target is 17%, so we thought we were in fairly good shape at that point. Um, you can see in the projection, we're projecting a 13% reserve. Um, I talked yesterday about the refinancing and the return of the $4.6 million. Um, that is not as part of this calculation. So once that returns, um, I would anticipate reserves to be um, higher than um, are actually shown based on, on the current projections that we had earlier. Um, and then just the, the quick variance um, on both revenues and expenses. Um, I talk about the deficit. We had one-time expenditures for CMS planned this year. That's the 1.3. What we're projecting is only $200,000 in use of reserves for this year. And just COVID impacts, I, I think I talked about the decreases in revenues. These are really the areas, um, at least initially the short term. And then long term, certainly Steve talked about leasing rates yesterday and renewals that will be coming up and how that will impact leasing revenues. Um, voluntary fees and fee scaling. Certainly we saw some fee scaling, not because of COVID, but just because of the increase from 40 to 64. We're not sure what it will be next year, um, but certainly there will be impacts for those attorneys that made under 64,000 this year. And then just long-term um, pension and retiree costs. Um, CalPERS uh, did not meet um, their 7.25% or 7.125% um, anticipated return return for this past year. So that's going to have some impacts going forward, um, which we'll see in a couple of years. And um, I won't go into this. This just shows you really those five categories um, and what the impacts are. Trust fund revenue, which is the bottom one. Again, this is the IOLTA funding um, that is used for legal services. Um, a pretty significant impact. Um, now, they have some reserves and, and we'll be using those over the next couple of years, but um, if the Fed rate stays at where it is um, for any long period of time, this will have a, a longer term impact. Um, just for the benefit of the board, the, the established compliance rate last year um, in April was 1.7%. Um, banks like Wells Fargo, who have a billion dollars in, in trust funds, were paying that money. Um, now it's 0.68%. Uh, and then that sort of concludes my presentation. I'm certainly open for any questions. Here's the resolution. Um, and that's my final presentation. So. Thank you, John. Uh, discussion or questions? Josh. Yeah, just a real quick one, John. Um, I heard you say that the interest reserve that's going to be returned on the 
um, uh, uh, restructuring of the debt that we approved yesterday is not in any of the calculations. I think if I remember from yesterday, there was a um, debt payment savings. Is that in the calculations or is the, or none of it's in it? No, um, none of, um, so there will be an, um, we'll be paying less interest, but it's only for, it's only for the, you know, 60 days or so. Um, so that, that we didn't, it, not to say it's marginal, but we just didn't include in the projection. But I think your bigger point, Josh, is um, the 4.6 million that is not um, included in this in in this in this in this slide, and that will be returned. Now, um, revenues and expenses, and it's hard to explain, but revenues and expenses don't necessarily um, have a one-for-one -one impact on our reserves um, because of the way we define our reserves. So it's a little early to say, but certainly a large portion of that 4.6 million will be put back in and be available to, um, to support the state bar and, and, to, and to meet that reserve of that 17%. Other questions? Sean, it's Sonia Dillon. Oh, yeah. Yes. Hi, thank you. Um, First, I just want to um, express my gratitude to, to Chen and we came on board at the same time. And so I just want to thank you for being responsive to our inquiries and, and um, clarifications. Um, it has been a challenging time because of not only of COVID-19, which came today, this, this year, but we, do have, we did have the, the fee increase and um, uh, technology also as being part of that with challenges of uh, payroll not being uh, you know uh, there at that time uh, in a timely manner so I just want to thank uh, John and his team for um, helping us with uh, the budget for and the finance of uh, health, the health of the finance of the state bar and working with our auditors and 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 through the, the COVID-19 um, thank you, John, and uh, good luck with your new ventures, endeavors. Thank you That's very it. much. Thank you. Jose? Oh. Uh, no, yeah, thank you. Um, I actually don't have any questions. I'd like to join Sonia in uh, expressing our gratitude for this great work. And if there's no other discussion, I will uh, make a motion on the resolution. Thank you. And Sonia would like to second it. <laughs> just, just a comment. I, I've enjoyed my time here. It's been amazing. And Sonia, as you said, we came in about the same time. Um, I've learned a lot from all of you. I've enjoyed certainly uh, chair, uh, working with the chairs of the audit and finance committee and the committees. And it's just, uh, you know, thinking about all the work that's happened over the last two years, just um, had a great time. And, um, you know, I think the state bar has always been on the right path and um, it's just been great the last two years. So I appreciate all your, all your insights and feedback and um, support. So thank you. Sean dropped. Ruben, what are you doing? Looks like we lost Sean, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> we've got a motion on the table to approve the resolution as presented uh, with a second. Are there any changes to the motion? Okay, Sarah, if you'll take the roll. Broughton? Yes. Chan? Yes. Cisneros? Aye. Dela Cruz? Yes. Dellen? Yes. Duran? Yes. Ganong? Yes. Pertula? Yes. Sowell? Yes. Stallings? Yes. The motion carries. <clears throat> All right. Ruben, thank you for stepping in. I had a problem. I had to switch to my <laughs> internet. Uh, Sarah, are you able to hear me now? Yes, I think oh, uh, good. open session is concluded. <clears throat>
I think it is. So now we're going to move into closed session. Uh, trustees, check your email for the link. Uh, we'll be handling item 7001 pursuant to government code section 11126 subdivision E2C and uh, item 7002 7, pursuant to government code section 11126 subdivision E1. All right, we'll see you in closed.